hallelujah. We give you the glory and the honor. Thank you, Jesus. No other name but the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. He's holy, amen. He's worthy of all your praise. He's worthy of all the honor. Amen. Why don't you just tell him that in your heart right now? If you feel like speaking it out, then do that. Thank you, Lord. You are the Holy One. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In every way, the perfect example. Thank you, worship team, thank you for leading us today. It's good to see Bob up there today. Well, as you're still standing, let's go ahead and, uh, and uh, do offering. Um, I, was, I was looking at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It's kind of an offering verse, but the Lord really spoke to me in it. Verses six and, uh, 6 and 7 says this, Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bounti bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And I thought of not just giving of money, not just even giving of time, but also in the way that I worship the Lord. You know, when you sow bountifully you will reap bountifully when we sow into worshiping the lord we reap things from the lord but just like in this verse the condition the attitude of our hearts is really really important it's important that we're not reluctant in the way that we approach him it's important that we're not under compulsion because god loves a cheerful giver amen so let's just pray. Lord, help us to give today because we want to. Help us to bring a cheerful attitude to our giving today, Lord, as we give to honor you, not because you need the money, Lord, but because we want to honor you and we want to be obedient to you. You say you love a cheerful giver. Lord, give us a cheerful heart. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for the miraculous in our lives. We thank you for the countless testimonies of how you have been so trustworthy with our money. Because <laughs> it's not ours, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Teach us to be open-handed with everything that you've given us, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the great gift that you are to us. Oh, thank you, Jesus for that sacrifice. Oh, my heart just always goes there. Thank you, Jesus. You gave so much. Help us to have the right attitude. Help us to bring cheerfully that gift to you, Lord. Thank you. We honor you and we glorify you. Jesus, it's in your precious name we pray this. Amen. All right. This side, if you come forward and give to that basket, that side to that side, you know how it works. And uh, go ahead and take your seat if you would. Uh, the kids are free to go to the kids' class. Zoe and Naomi are handling the kids' class today, so that'll be wonderful. Bless you, kids. Be good for your teacher. Jesus is watching. Oh, 
Thank you, Lord. Well, I'm, I'm grateful my, my wonderful machine here started working. I had to do the announcements off of the notes and the way the printer printed it off. I could barely read it, so I am, I am grateful that I don't have to stagger through my notes. Uh, Tim, you can go ahead and kill that pad. Well, last week, anyone remember what we talked about? Quiet place, the quiet place. Secret place will work as well. The quiet place. It's, uh, it's important that we make time for that intimacy with the Lord. And we talked about kind of the vitalness of building that pattern and that habit of prioritizing intimacy with the Lord over everything else. And um, I came across kind of a, a loose interpretation of what the word idolatry is this week as I was studying out for this weekend. It said this, idolatry is allowing anything else to take the place that solely belongs to God. I thought, Boy, I've got a lot of idolatry in my life. How many of you know that God belongs at the absolute pinnacle, the absolute top? That is his place. For the Christian life, that is the place for God. Amen? Are we agreed on that? Once we have the good habit of, of uh, harboring and protecting that quiet place, uh, our intimacy with God is going to grow leaps and bounds. And I made a statement to you last week. It said, if you're living in fear, you need to get closer to Jesus. You have fear in your life? And look, it's, it's easy to look around what's going on in the world and be a little bit afraid. I want to tell you, if you're living in fear, not if you ever experience fear, fear will come against you. The Holy Spirit will guard you. But if you're not walking in that closeness and that intimacy with the Lord, then a lot of times the fear will get right in. And so I say again, if you're living in fear, you need to get closer to Jesus. Amen? I firmly believe that Jesus modeled sleeping through a deadly storm in Matthew chapter 8. I believe he modeled that peacefulness for us on purpose. He modeled for us what true godly peace is. Can do for us. Now I know that we are not a church that looks at itself in the mirror and then walks away and forgets who we are. Amen. We are not that. So I am hoping that you have not only been reflecting on the quiet place that we talked about last week, but that you've actually been applying that. And what you will have found if you have been doing that already, even just after one week, what you will have found was that the promise that I made to you uh, was true. That when you make room in that quiet place, you make room for him, you prioritize him, you schedule everything else, else in your life around him, you will walk in a state of true peace. And that true peace will hold even in the midst of a storm. Amen? Mother Teresa was famously quoted saying, We need to find God, and he cannot be found in noise and restlessness. God is the friend of silence. And then she goes on to talk about nature and how silent nature is and how that points to God being a friend of silence. Today I want to talk to you about not just the quiet place, but another couple of ways that we can get closer to God. Again, I believe the Holy Spirit has us, and by us I mean this church, uh, in a time of recentering and re-examination. I mean that specifically as it relates to our personal relationship with him. Amen. <laughs> and how that plays itself out in our everyday walk. This is going to be more about how we, how we act and how we think, the things that we do, the things that we prioritize in the 166 hours a week that we spend away from church, and less about the corporate setting and the two hours a week that we spend in church. So again, Pastor Adam's getting invasive this week. And even in those two hours a week that we spend in church, you know, so many times we show up to church looking for what we can get from God. 
instead of how we can bless God. We are his followers. It is not the other way around. We need to become more like God. The way that we accomplish that is by getting closer to him. Amen. When we're together in this service, so many times the emphasis is, is even during the service, the emphasis seems to be on what God is going to do. What, what is God going to do for us? And I want to challenge you. I want to challenge myself. But that's the wrong emphasis. We're looking at the wrong thing. I've said many times to bring your expectation. And I believe that that's true. It's a wonderful thing to expect great things from a great God. But so often an overemphasis on what God is going to do for us can pervert the very reason that we are embracing the gathering of the saints in the first place. Came across this, uh, this statement as well, and it just hit me so hard. If you want to run the Holy Spirit out of a meeting, just tell people that he is there just to meet all their needs. Oh. He won't stick around long when he's treated like a genie. Amen? Now, I'm not saying that he won't meet needs or that he doesn't want to meet your needs. Obviously, he does. He's a good God. He's a good father. We know all of that. But when we show up just to get our fix from the Holy Spirit, he will rarely stick around when that kind of an attitude is prevalent. Just telling you. Many of you have experienced. Many of you have felt. Walk into a service and, and there's an air and there's a presence to it that, that is, is very godly. And sometimes that will diminish and then depart. You ever ask yourself why? Why does that happen? Oh, it seemed like everything was fine. But are we harboring an atmosphere where he is welcome to be worshipped? We are here to worship God, not to get a fix. And so we bring our expectation, not because we want him to do things for us, but because we want to worship him. We want to grow deeper with him. We want to become more like him, not simply because he is the source of our fix. It's the same reason we bring our tithes and our offering. It's, it's, it's the same concept. Um, if you look in 2 Corinthians 9, how much our attitude is the focal point of when we bring our tithes and offerings, not begrudgingly or because we're prodded to or because the, the preacher goes on and on and on about how, how you need to bring your tithes. No, it's all about your attitude. And in the same way, the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, not the indwelling inside of you, but the indwelling within our service is largely dependent on the attitudes that we have. And, and I think that there's, there's a time for us, and I think that maybe now is this time, to take seriously our own personal attitudes and what we bring with us to our meetings. Because it largely affects the Holy Spirit himself. So, if, um, if you want to run the Holy Spirit out of a meeting, then just tell people that he's there to meet all their needs. If that's true, then somewhat ironically, if you want to run people out of a meeting, just remind them that they have come to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You come to worship, not to receive. Now, now I can see the confused looks. If receiving is a result of worshiping, then everything is in line. But if receiving is the reason that you come, get ready to not receive. Because there won't be there much there for you. I have to tell you, given the option between those two, running the Holy Spirit off or running people off, given the option, I would, I would rather, like I'm just going to be truthful, I would rather harbor an atmosphere for the Holy Spirit than make room for begrudging people. That's what we're after, and I believe that's part of what the, uh, the realignment is. Because we all know how to live our corporate Christianity to where we show up together and do church together. And look, that really is a beautiful thing. This gathering is a biblical and a beautiful thing. 
And I don't have any problem with it at all. Um, I'm talking about taking steps to make to make sure that church isn't your only Christian experience. Does, does that make sense? I want to make sure for you that you understand that this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is really, and we've been involved in, in churches that called Sunday morning the overflow. That, that Sunday morning is just the overflow of what we as Christians experience in Christ during the week. And we're so filled up, and we're so excited to be followers of Jesus and worshipers of Jesus that the overflow happens when we come together and we spill out onto one another because we're so excited for Jesus. Now, frankly, I don't see that very often, but that doesn't mean we can't get there. I'll tell you, I want to remind you today that there's so much more. Some of you know that. Some of you don't. I myself am somewhere in between. I'm learning that there is so much more. Somebody who understands what I'm saying. Come on. There's so much more. Your week should be filled with Christian experiences, with Christ experiences, with Holy Spirit experiences, Holy Spirit leadings. Our week should be filled with that stuff. If this service is the only place that you drink of the good things of God, then that trains you to show up with the sole expectation that God will meet all of your needs and tick all of your boxes. That's what that, 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 that attitude trains you to think that way. This is an unfulfilled Christian life that I've just described. All right. Now that I've set this, uh, this table and everyone's wondering where this is going, <laughs> today's message is titled, Growing Closer. Growing Closer. As the days grow darker in this world, we hear about yet another school shooting or we hear about acts of terrorism either on our own home soil or abroad. We hear about craziness. We hear about the economy taking its 30th nosedive in, I don't know, let's just say the last three and a half years. I'm just going to throw that time frame out. When storms, when storms come and winds and waves rage, when these things happen, and that's just part of life, right? Inescapably, it leaves me thinking one thing because these things happen all the time shoot i mean even just last night i had written this sermon already and and then last night i'm reading the news about iran and i'm thinking you know this stuff is scary imagine for them thank god for that iron dome man that thing boy their defenses are great i sure wish those people would turn their hearts over to the lord though Man, their hope would be secure like yours and mine is. We've got to pray for them. When you hear about these things, every single time, it, it, yeah, I feel secure because I know the Lord and I know where I'm going if I die, if I keel over right here and right now. I know where I'm going. But every single time I hear of these terrible things that are happening in our world, every single time I go, i got to be closer to Jesus. Every single time, it just makes me, it just drives me. I need to get closer to Jesus. If I'll just get closer to Jesus, I will have the answers on how to handle a diverse mixture of problems and storms. I'll have the grace to handle difficult people. And all you difficult people said amen. Hey, all right. <laughs> it was a trap. You all fell into it. I tell you. I'll have the humility to make changes in my marriage, in my parenting, finances, wherever it needs to be, if I'll just get closer to Jesus. And these are just a few, just a few of the many, many benefits of getting close to Jesus. And why are these things true? Well, it's because the closer I get to Jesus, the more like Jesus I will become. Have you seen that in your own life? 
Isn't that a beautiful transposition? You can give him your filth, and in its place, he gives you his glory. He gives you a reflection of himself. We got to get closer to Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> hmm. You know, I'm, I'm just thinking, <laughs> as I'm actually talking this out, you know, the reasons that we come to church are very important. Our attitudes are very important. And I think that the reason this is still being emphasized in my spirit is that if it's true that the closer I get to Jesus, the more like Jesus I become, then showing up to church for the wrong reasons is really, really bad. I, I just encourage you, just as we, as we move on here in just a second, I just encourage you to show up for the right reasons. I, I don't think that that's too much to ask. And I think the Holy Spirit is, is directing this. We need to show up for the right reasons, not because of tradition. I said not because of tradition. But because we have an intense and burning desire to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So, what does the Bible say about us getting closer to God? I want to turn your attention to Luke chapter 9, verse 23, where Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. As I think about this verse, you know, getting close to Jesus at first is, is going to be about obeying. Especially if you're fresh on this journey. Or maybe you're a seasoned Christian who, who hasn't necessarily lived this way before. And you're, maybe you're an older person and you're, you're just now going, you know what, I'm going to seek the Lord with all of my heart. Like I grew up hearing but never have done. Maybe you're new to this journey of just seeking him with intensity. If that's you, you're going to find that getting close to Jesus at first is is going to just be about obeying. Not, you're not going to necessarily get joy or enjoyment out of it early on in this process. I'm just trying to be real with you today, okay? Because I think if you go into it with the wrong expectation, it's going to sour the process of what he wants to do in you. Getting close to Jesus at first will be about doing what he said, because he said to do it. The joy of obedience, the joy of obedience is something that comes out of obedience. It's a result of obedience. Again, sowing and reaping. We have to sow obedience and we will get from it joy. So in the beginning of it, don't be surprised if you're not overjoyed. That's okay. Okay. If you're new to the idea of denying yourself, maybe you've never fasted before, and this last time at the turn of the year was the first time you did it, you're like, holy cow, that is rough. Yeah, if you're new to denying yourself, one of the greatest mistakes that you can make is expecting that the denying of yourself is going to somehow be fun. It's not fun. And that's okay. I want to tell you, that's okay. You're denying yourself, after all. You're denying the things that you actually do want. And you're lying if you say you don't want them. Oh, no, I just want to walk in self-sacrifice. I want to just deny myself all these things that I love. You liar. No, you don't. It's perfectly fine to not love it in the moment. Look, I had this conversation with someone actually this week. And I told her that when you first begin the process of denying yourself for the purpose of favoring God's plan and his will and his desires, it is perfectly fine to not love it in the moment. I would say trust the process. Trust the process. It isn't realistic to expect that you'll be jumping up and down for joy when you place your own will, your own desires, your own wants on the sacrificial barbecue. That is not fun. Think about Abraham. And 
Isaac. Think about that. Don't make the mistake of thinking that Abraham was all excited to sacrifice his son, who was the personification of the promise, on a slab. Don't think he was excited about that. And yet, did he waver? Did he flinch even for a moment? In fact, when he, when he told his servants their instructions as he left them at the foot of the mountain to go up, he said, we, meaning him and his son, we are going up to the mountain to worship and we will return to you. Hmm. He had a relationship with his God and he knew the promise. And I want to tell you that sometimes you have no other option than to cling to the promise. Amen? Hmm. Sometimes this is what denying yourself is. Submitting what you want at the feet of Jesus, then taking the time to find out what he wants, and then doing that instead. That's the process. That's how it goes. In demonstrating this lifestyle for us, Jesus prayed to the Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And yet, and yet, the most important and yet, not my will, but yours be done. See, we too often get stuck in church on the making our desires known to God. We get stuck on that part without submitting our will to his. Jesus demonstrated it perfectly. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. He's very clearly saying, Father, I really don't want to do this. And yet, it is more about what you want than, I wa than what I want. And submitting to that hierarchy. Jesus also said, I do the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus also said, if you love me, obey my commandments. Jesus also said, when his parents questioned a 12-year-old Jesus... Jesus said, where did you think I would be if not in my father's house, being about my father's business? The more Jesus demonstrated his submittedness to his father, the more it shows us how important that submittedness is. 1 John chapter 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him. I said, and by this we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments, that's the by this. Whoever says, I know him, and we hear this a lot in our culture. Oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I heard Taylor Swift was a, was a Christian. I'm sorry, but no. I heard Justin Timberlake was a Christian. Justin Timberlake just released the most demonic, vile music. It's being called the most demonic music video that has ever been released. Horrible, horrible. I saw a clip of it. It was, it was gag worthy. He's a Christian. Oh, yeah. I know God. This Bible, this, this verse is talking about that person. Anyone who says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in them. But whoever keeps his word, in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this, we may know that we are in him. You know, I find that the closer I get to Jesus, the more like Jesus I become. To the point where eventually all I will care about is being about God's business in the same way that Jesus was. To the point that I'm not just paying lip service in saying, I know him, I know Jesus, but to actually live it. By what, again? By what will we know? By keeping his commandments. Jesus didn't make any mistake in John 14, 15, when he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He didn't say, if you love me, Say it all the time. He didn't say, if you love me, pay your tithes and offerings. If you love me, get involved in kids' ministry. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. What does the word keep there mean? 
walk in, live in. This is not a one-time event. That's the whole point. That's what we're talking about. Living these things out. Keeping his commandments is by no means a one-time event. We keep his commandments in the same way that we keep a home. In the same way that we keep track of our kids. This is meant to be a keeping, a normal, regular thing. Keep my commandments. James 4, 8 says, Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. It would have been so much easier if he just said, Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. He had to just keep talking. Psalm 73, verse 28 says, For me it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. I think it's interesting how he says, I have made the Lord my refuge. That's nothing that we do other than that we choose where we're going to have refuge. That's what he's saying. I have chosen to take refuge in the Lord. That's what he's saying. For me, it is good to be near God. <clears throat> I would say for all of us, it's good to be near God. And then, of course, there's 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, and 18, which you all know. We quote it all the time. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It's very obvious just in these few verses, and there are many, like hundreds more, um, about getting close to God. It's very clear that it's vital to gain and maintain a closeness with the Lord. I said gain and maintain. The gaining is good. That's the first step. But if you don't maintain it, you will lose it. How many of you have, have gained healing and then lost it? How many of you have gained wealth and then lost it? How many of you have gained freedom from addictions and then lost it? We must gain and maintain. The maintain is every bit as important, probably more so, than the gaining. The gaining is there for us. Amen? The Lord has this for you. It's up to us to walk in it. The closer I get to Jesus, the more like Jesus I will become. So it's really, really important that I get closer for my sake, which directly relates to you as the pastor of this church, but for you personally. That's why it's so important that you get closer. You'll become more like Jesus. Does anyone in this house want that? How many of you have seen the desperate need that we get more like Jesus and less like us? If the number one way that we do that is to choose and prioritize and then protect at all costs the quiet place with Jesus, then I want to examine with you today what a few other ways are that we get closer with Jesus. So let's get practical here for just a few minutes. So number one, the quiet place with the Lord. The 12th century poet Rumi said, the quieter you become, the more you are able to hear. It's just, that's just a truism. That's just simple. And yet, if you think about that, oh, so many times. And I said this last week, so forgive me for repeating myself, but it's so true. We got to remember, when we come into the quiet place with the Lord, shh, the quiet place, that quiet place is not for you to blah, 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 blah. It's not. That's not what it's there for. It's not for you to complain. It's not for you to talk about how evil your husband is. It's not for you to complain about your wife and how she just... It's not for that. It's for you to get in a right posture before the Lord because when you get quiet, you will begin to hear. But if you're allowed, you will hear nothing. I think that one statement best sums up why it's so vital that we get quiet before the Lord. Come before him, get quiet, hear him speak. What a simple formula. I said, come before him. Got to choose that. Got to
Got to prioritize that. Got to make room for that. Time for that. We're all busy. Come before him. Get quiet. Hear him speak. Do you want to hear him speak to you today? Amen. I do too. Now this could be its own point, but it, it kind of fit better as a sub point within the quiet place. Um, when you're in that quiet place, uh, I strongly encourage you to be real. Be real about where you are and who you are before the Lord. Remember who you're dealing with. The one who knit you together in your mother's womb. The one who's known you since the beginning, before the beginning of time. The one who knows you very, very well. The one who put you into this place and this time on purpose for a reason, for a purpose. He knows you very well. I encourage you to be real. Don't be guarded. Just be open and be real about who and what you are before the Lord. It's a place of honesty and a place of vulnerability where the Lord can really reach in and touch you. I encourage you to do that. Uh, number two. So number one was that quiet place with the Lord. Number two, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Proverbs 4, verse 23, cautions us to guard your heart with all diligence. Why? Because from your heart flow the springs of life. Another version says, everything you do flows from your heart. If the Bible's correct here, and everything that we do flows out of our motivations and the conditions of our heart, then yes, guarding our heart is very, very, very important. So what does it mean, guarding your heart? Well, there's an entire separate teaching in itself, which we may get into soon, but not today. But I believe in order to apply biblical and godly precedent to the question, what does guarding your heart mean? The answer is that we only allow the things into our lives that are pleasing to God and in line with Scripture. Now, if you're anything like me, when I wrote those lines down, I immediately started introspecting. And found, oh boy, oh boy. And probably a lot of you thinking the same thing. Like, oh man. When you look at it that way, are we really that good at guarding our hearts? And yet we are intended to guard our hearts because out of our hearts flow all of the issues of life. Guarding your heart may be seen as setting guards around the ground of your heart. Imagine it that way. Guards, shoulder to shoulder, back to the heart, and the grounds of the heart protected from every angle. Setting guards around your heart, guarding your heart. So they're preventing these guards, preventing unwholesome, unholy things, unhealthy things from entering the grounds of your heart. And again, this is so important because according to Proverbs, the heart is... <clears throat> excuse me, it's like the processing plant. It's like the processing plant where all of the issues of life, all of our decisions, all of our motivations, our relationships, our drives and our impulses, the things that we will seek as a result of those drives and impulses, those all come out of the heart. One secular magazine article I came across headlined this statement. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Be careful who you spend time with. Their thoughts and actions will impact yours. Seems like even the secular world understands the concept that the closer I get to Jesus, the more like Jesus I will become. And if that's true, then the less savory fact is also true. The closer I get to the world, the more like the world I will become. <laughs> so I guess a sub point that kind of goes along with guard your heart would be build a community of Christian friends. 
I was watching an interview uh, this last week about a woman who had left um, a particular political party affiliation, left it hard. <laughs> Suddenly woke up and was like, uh, I, I can't partner with this anymore. She lost all of her friends, every one of her friends. She lost every single one of her family members, completely ostracized as a result of it. I would caution you, look, surround yourself with people who believe the same way that you do. There's power in that. There's even power in people who are of a like mind to do evil things. Evil is empowered in unity in the same way that good is empowered in unity. Surround yourself with Christian friends. How many of you know bad company corrupts good morals? You ever heard that one before? So number one, that quiet place with the Lord. Get it, maintain it. Number two, guard your heart. Number three, read and study the word of God. I'm going to spend very little time on this one, but notice that I did say read and study. Two different words, two very different actions. Read the word of God and study the word of God. You want to know what God said? What God is saying? And what God says about the future? Read the word. Read the Bible. Number four, be generous. That one came out of left field for me. I prayed on it for a while, and I thought, man, that is so true. Get, to get closer to the Lord, one way that I can get closer to the Lord is by being generous. When I think about Jesus, what I think more often than, it, than any other facet of Jesus and my relationship with him is how much he gave for me. I think about it all the time. If I'm thinking about other things and all of a sudden Jesus pops into my mind, that's what I'm thinking about, how much he gave for me. I'm not thinking about how much I give for him or how much he asks of me or, or this, that, or the other. For me, personally, I'm not saying it's the same for you. It's probably not. But for me personally, all I think about is how much he gave for me, how generous he was for me. And still, I still have not figured out why. I say it every time. I still haven't figured out why. I don't know why. Why he saw such value. But he did. And he was so generous. And so for me, getting closer to Jesus is tapping into what that generosity means. In fact, I came across a verse when I was studying this out about being generous in 1 John chapter 3. Uh, verse 17, he says this, If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? I found it quite remarkable that the acquisition and the possession of material things could be so closely tied with whether or not the love of God is in us, based on our willingness to be generous with those in need. Very interesting. Acts chapter 20, verse 35 in all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Did you know that there's actual blessing? Real, actual blessing to be in the seat of the giver. Much more so than to be the recipient of the gift. That's biblical. We don't always understand it. We don't always feel it in the moment. And yet the beauty of that is that both of those things are equal to being a recipient. Because it's a godly precedent that it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so when we align ourselves with that, we align ourselves with his blessing. So both of those things equal receiving. I think that's a beautiful thing about God. Along with this one could be uh, practice gratitude and contentment. Not all of us have a great deal of money. Not all of us have a great deal of possessions. I encourage you to not look at it that way, to not use that as a gauge at all. The 
question should be, how do you be generous with what you have been given? Hmm. What is that verse about being given a little bit, being trusted with much? I feel like that's in the Bible somewhere. Number five, obey God. You've heard me say many times, God only needs one thing from you in order to radically change relationships, in order to radically change your finances, in order to radically change, shoot, look beyond that, into our communities, the school system, government, the whole world. In order to radically change those things, he only needs one thing, and that is our That means that when he asks us to do something, we don't look at it as optional. If he's asking us to do it, the answer is yes. And we walk in obedience. We can't afford to say no to him. With our yes, he can do anything he wants to accomplish. I would say this, a congregation of Christians who give God their radical yes is actually an army that is capable of performing, of carrying out all of God's plans and desires on this earth. We don't see it because we don't walk in obedience. Oh, I don't see that in the church. I don't see the church carrying out God's plan and desire. Yeah, right, I don't either. You're not missing something. It's because we lack the one thing that we must bring to the table. Our yes. Our obedience to him. Imagine a Christian people who care more about saying yes to God than they do about saying yes to their own desires. You know, that's our problem. I get this. This is, this is a little lower key today, but I hope it's impacting you. Our problem is that too many times we just say yes to ourselves. That's our problem. If I could spell out the entire Christian issue, sum it up into one thing, it would be that. We've just gotten used to saying yes to ourselves, and we've somehow given ourselves permission to think that that's okay. It's not okay. It never was okay. Should we just go on sinning then? If that's okay, then shouldn't we just go on sinning just so that grace can abound? Yeah, I don't think so. Pretty sure the Bible says something about that too. Uh, one way that we can get closer to God, and this is the final one, I found this hilariously absent from, as I was kind of studying out this topic, and nobody was talking about it. I thought it was pretty hilarious that this is not on other people's list, and it's like my top, one of my top two. Reading the Bible and praying would be like number one. Number two for me, fasting. That is... You will get so, man, when you start stripping away the things that you really want, oh my goodness, there's no quicker way to start hearing the voice of the Lord and to start feeling his closeness. It motivates him to move in and hold you up. Hmm. You've heard me say this a number of times, there's no better way to get closer to God quickly than to deny yourself Everything that could put itself in his place of importance. Again, a loose definition of what idolatry is. Anything that elevates itself into a position that God should be in. Basically anything that's more important to you than the Lord. Now let me be clear. Fasting from TV is good. That's healthy for you. But that is not a biblical fast. I hate to break it to you, my friends. I've done it. I've done it. I've believed it. And I've believed wrong. Just al along with you. Fasting from your smartphone, that's good for you, but it ain't biblical fast. Oh, I've, my wife, I'm fasting from coffee. She doesn't say this anymore because we both had revelation on what biblical fasting is. Her thing used to be fasting from coffee because it's a, her coffee. If you know my wife at all, it's like half of her whole entire world is wrapped up in her coffee. How long did it take the Lord to to create the universe. Seven days, was it? Six? Takes her about that long to make a cup of coffee. Longer to drink it. She goes to the microwave, 
30 times before that cup is gone. Fasting from, from coffee is good, but in a biblical fast. A biblical fast is about denying ourselves food, nourishment, and depending on the duration of your fast, about denying yourself water and other liquids as well. We, we are close with some people who, who have gotten extreme and, and I, mean, I mean extreme in a good way. But if you knew some of the stories we've heard from these folks um, about fasts that they've gone on, um, I'll, I'll share one, and you have to correct me if I'm wrong here, um, but the, the grandmother who fasted for 40 days from food and from water, was that you that told us about that? the end of it yeah I mean you talk about pulling close to the Lord and relying on him for everything that is wild some of the so when Holly has has fasted some of the remarkable I, I think the same thing like man she's making us this wonderful food for dinner and stuff and I'm like I either didn't join her on her fast or mine ended suspiciously earlier than hers I'm telling you you want to get close to the Lord fast deny yourself what you think you can't live without put yourself truly in a state of trust in the Lord and see if he will not sustain you amen fasting that's a great way to get closer to the Lord I want to review these really quickly just I'm just going to retrace them for you note takers a quiet place with the Lord number one uh, 1A to that would be be real and totally truthful with who you are and where you are. Number two, guard your heart. Um, 2A to that would be build a community of Christian friends. Number three, read and study the word of God. Number four, be generous. Amen. Number five, obey God. And number six, fasting. Amen. Amen. How many of you know that we need to get closer to God? I believe this time of recentering that we're all in. You're, you're a part of this church. The Lord has this church in a time of recentering. Some of you are like, okay, I know all of this stuff. Good. I'm glad you stayed plugged in. Some of you are like, I'm, I'm already on fire. I'm a, I'm a firebrand for Jesus. I'm already good. You are an example to those who aren't. And thank you for staying plugged in. For, for the rest of us, myself included in parts of this, there, there are immaturities that sneak into our Christian life that need to be snipped off, that need to be corrected away. And when we are willing to face those things and look at them truthfully, what we'll find is the Lord is right there to help us. And he wants us to get closer to him. Amen? Go ahead and stand to your feet if you would. Let's just pray. Lord, thank you for giving us ways, for giving us means to get closer to you. I thank you, Lord. We're not just here. <laughs> We're not just here to get our fix. That's not why we came today, Lord. We thank you. We are here to worship you because you are, you are so completely worthy of all of our worship. Lord, we thank you that, as, that when we align ourselves correctly, with you lord when our attitudes are right blessing is a result of that but lord sometimes we've gotten it wrong we come seeking the blessing and we leave with nothing because our attitudes are wrong help us lord to catch those things holy spirit you live inside of us i pray that you would activate these things highlight these things in every single person here holy spirit lead us and guide us we need you we thank you that you are the ever-present help. You're always with us. How can that be? That's because you live inside of us. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that it's true that when we get closer to you, Jesus, we will become more like you. 
when we get closer to you? Why is it that when we, we go into that quiet place complaining about our spouse and we come out praying for them instead, that's because we've become a little bit more like you? Why is it, Lord, when we go in thinking that our finances are in ruin and then we come out in a place of hope, even despite the circumstances, that's because we've gotten a little bit more like you. Help us, Lord, as we endeavor to become more like you by taking these steps. I pray that each person here would take this, this message in, this teaching, as they would examine it for themselves, Lord, eat the hay, spit out the sticks, and then move forward getting closer with you, Jesus, because that's what we need. That's my desire as, the, as the, the pastor of this church, my desire more than financial gain, more than a bigger building, more than more bathrooms. Lord, we do need more bathrooms. <laughs> but Lord, more than that, my desire for this group of people, this group of people who are here because they love you, Lord, my desire for this group of people is that they'll get closer to you and as a result of that, become more like you, Jesus. That's what we want. That's what will affect our communities. That's what will save our marriages. That's what will redeem our children. That's what will help our finances. That's what will help our communities. That. And so that is what we seek, Lord, becoming more like you. Thank you, Jesus. We give you what little we have. And we know, Lord, that when our attitudes are right, you are willing to fill us with what you have. And those things are so plentiful and so full of blessing. Thank you, Lord. We honor you today, Lord. That's what it's all about. We honor you. We love you. We worship you. And we thank you for an opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters in you and just to worship you. Thank you, Lord. We love you. Jesus, it's in your mighty name that we pray these things. And amen.